Turn me in Romans 14. While you're turning there, Romans chapter 14. <clears throat> One of the songs that we sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Does anybody know who wrote that? Martin Luther. Martin Luther is sometimes called the father of the Protestant Reformation. Um, on October 31st, 1517, he nailed the 95 Thesis on the church door at Wittenberg. And what these 95 Theses were is there were arguments that where the Roman Catholic Church had gone against the Bible. And with this, he wanted just to have a discussion. Hey, let's get back to what the Scripture says. He, uh, through a little bit of time, he was branded a heretic, and he was brought to a place called the Council of Worms. Um, now, if you ever read it in a book, it's Can Council of Worms, but there weren't a bunch of worms. It was Worms. That's the name of the area. And a whole bunch of documents were laid out. And they said, Martin Luther, these documents are from heretics that have already been burned at the stake. And you seem to agree with them. Do you recant? Or do you wish to hold on to these heresies that have already caused people to be burned at the stake? Now, you can imagine, that's a very serious question. Even though Martin Luther was, was told, guaranteed, that he would make it back to his hometown safe, uh, he didn't exactly trust in that, and he knew that if he did not recant, if he said, yes, um, I believe what I've said is truthful and honest, and that's where we need to go, he knew that his life would just simply be very, very short. And so the inquisitors that were there, Martin Luther said, could you give me one day so I can pray about this? And they said, okay. So the next day, the charges again were brought before him. Mr. Luther, you seem to be agreeing with all of these heretics. Do you recant? And it's recorded that Martin Luther said, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. Thus I cannot and will not recant because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. And at that point... Martin Luther was condemned at the Diet of Worms as a heretic. By the way, Luke, you are fine exactly where you're at, but we do have that room. You just want to rock her to sleep. That's fine. You might enjoy that better. <laughs> yeah, she's, oh, yes, I get to go to the comfy chair. That's all she wanted. <laughs> yeah. Mama's not feeling well today, so dad's, dad's doing everything. We're talking about the conscience. In Romans 14, starting with verse 1, it says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. And, and we have this... Um, we have this uh, um, scripture that says, in this church, in this early church, by the way, um, if you had a problem at, 
at the church you were at in the book of, uh, uh, you know, back in the New Testament days, you couldn't just get all mad and then go to the next church down the road. There was not another church down the road. And so you had to sort it out in love and in house. And so there came a situation where there were some people that said, you know what, an idol really is nothing, and I can eat meat that's been offered to an idol, and it doesn't hurt me at all. As a matter of fact, it's even cheaper meat. I could even be a better steward of my money. Let's eat the meat. I think Taz would be a great person that would say, y'all are stupid, I'm eating whatever I want. Taz, can you see yourself in that situation? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, and, and some of these people probably said, and if you don't, you're dumb. You could see Taz doing that too, couldn't you? All right. Now, there are others that said, you know, my conscience won't let me. Uh, these things have been offered unto idols in my whole life. I was captive to these idols. I, I don't want to be associated with them anymore. And as a matter of fact, I think I'd just rather have a salad. You know, some, some lettuce and maybe a carrot or two. If I could have a cucumber, that would be great. And because their conscience was so afraid that they would eat something that's been offered unto an idol, they wouldn't do it. And the Bible is saying, don't argue about this. Leave each other alone. You guys are going to have different consciences. However, just like Martin Luther, you cannot violate your conscience in a safe manner. When I was a kid, I, I had a, uh, man, I had a few cars, but one that I remember was a uh, Dodge Colt. I don't even know what a Dodge Colt is. It was, um, wasn't that great of a car, but it was a car, okay? Now, when I was a kid just learning how to drive, you know, uh, I didn't care. Does, does it have wheels? Does it start? When I was a kid, you didn't even need to have the floorboard all the way intact. How many of you ever was in a car where like you could see the road when you were driving as a kid? Those were the days where you like bounce a coin and you try to get a hit in the car. That's bad. Don't do it. But I, was, I wasn't a Christian. Okay. Um, but I had this Dodge Colt and this little annoying red light kept on appearing on near the speedometer it's like a little box i don't know what it was and eventually it would go off so cool i'm, I'm good go and sometimes it come on and come, but i just ignored it and then uh and then i had like a little gravy symbol it was like a little gravy pour symbol that was on there and uh, i didn't know my car was low on gravy but apparently it was or something like that but anyways i looked at that and and I figured it would go off too. And I just kept on going and I would use it for weeks after that. And then finally my car went <laughs> and it shook <laughs> and just rolled to a stop. And apparently there was no oil in my engine and the engine froze. Not only did it freeze, the piston actually uh, rammed right through the side of the engine. The mechanic had said he had never seen anything quite like that before. And you know, when that check engine light comes on, you can argue about it. You can even ignore it, but it's on for a reason. Your conscience is kind of like a check engine light, if you will. You can argue about it. You can even ignore it but it's telling you something's going on. In, in the hospital where my wife's at, she's in the ICU, and um, it is the noisiest place in, in the world. Has anybody ever been in an ICU? You would think that it needs to all be quiet so people can rest. And all the machines, eh, eh, all the alarms are going off. And, uh, and I'm freaking out. Not a single nurse is freaking out. My wife adjusted herself, and all the oxygen and heart monitors dropped out. So it had her under cardiac arrest. Nobody came running. I mean, I was expecting them coming with a crash cart, you know, and clear, you know, doing the whole thing. Nothing happened. They, they had completely ignored it. 
because they had trained themselves to hear noises so much, they were immune to it. We can do that with our conscience too. Our conscience can be sounding alarms and we can ignore it. I think actually one of the most tragic examples I saw this was um, they have found that um, when planes crash, when we're talking about commercial airlines have tragic things happen, it is usually because the pilot has ignored the cockpit warning. It's going off. And instead of going to it, they're ignoring it. You can even hear them in the black box say it's nothing. Just two examples. Pilots of a doomed Air France jet, which crashed, I think this is like 10 years ago, into the Atlantic, killing all 228 people on board, ignored stall warnings, and actually defied what the manual said. The most recent one, you know the Alaskan Airlines where the side panel just went off? Um, uh, the cabin pressure warning light was going off for the three previous flights, and they ignored it. God is giving us a conscience. A conscience that really is God-given and shouldn't be ignored. Now, when I say conscience, I, I don't want you to think of uh, uh, Jimmy the Cricket. Remember Jimmy the Cricket, Pinocchio? Always let your conscience be your guide. I'm going to say that we need to make sure that our conscience matches up to the Word of God. Because the Apostle Paul says in Acts 23, verse 1, it says, Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. He says, My whole life I've had a clear conscience before God. Hold on a second, Paul. Wasn't there a time that you actually killed Christians? Paul says, yes, and my conscience was clear. So just because there is a clear conscience doesn't mean it's always the right conscience. I'm just going to throw that out there. But it's also not like sometimes we see, uh, you know, two voices, a shoulder angel and, uh, you know, the shoulder devil. You know, they're trying to talk you in and out. That really is not what we're talking about. Your conscience will be screaming. Your conscience will be saying this isn't right. Uh, the reason why so many young people lose their purity is because they go into a situation where their conscience is screaming this isn't right and they try to override it and they try to do something else. The reason why many marriages have failed is because the conscience has been screaming don't do this, don't say this, but they've ignored it and they've gone and done something else. God has given you a conscience for a reason. And I just want us to look at just a few verses in the Bible today. Um, I have had quite a few people contact me and say, Brother, if you're not ready to preach, we'll be more than happy to, to do it for you. And I appreciate that. Maybe at the end of this, maybe I'll go, Ooh, they were right. Somebody else should have done this. But I'm feeling good right now. In the book of Acts, if you have your Bible, turn to the books of Acts. We're going to go to a lot of different passages today. The book of Acts, if you're in the book of Romans, just turn left one book. That's going to be the book of Acts. And I'm going to do my best uh, to put this in some kind of order, though it won't be perfect. In Acts 24, verse 16. I love that sound. A page is turning. Acts 24, verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and towards men. I just need to stop us here and just understand what the Apostle Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I'm 
I have lived my life in such a way that I want my conscience clean before God. In other words, just like Martin Luther, his conscience is captive to the Word of God. Even when he was stoning Christians, he thought he was obeying God. Now, that doesn't mean he was right, and it doesn't mean it was okay. But there is something to be said of even when it's difficult, even when the situation uh, isn't positive, I'm going to uh, obey. Now, um, I had a, a guy, his name is Steve Jordy. Feel free to Google that name later on. Steve Jordy. It's on, it's on the video. You can look at it later. Steve Jordy one day uh, got an appointment with my pastor over in Fort Lauderdale. And he says, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so angry about abortion, about the killing of babies, that, uh, that uh, I believe it is my duty to stop it. And so I am going to start attacking abortion clinics. And my pastor told him, he says, though he agrees at the terrible situation of abortion in America, uh, the idea of blowing up abortion clinics did not come from God. Christian, God is not going to tell you to do something violent and terrible that's against His Word. And any kind of psychopath that tries to use the Bible as their defense is a liar and a criminal. By the way, my pastor said, I just want to let you know when you leave this office, I'm going to contact the FBI. And he did. And the guy still tried to do what he did and ended up getting arrested. But you can look it up online. This, this guy was crazy. Uh, look at 1 Timothy. Now this is to the right. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And while you're turning there, this is Paul talking to a young preacher named Timothy. And he's giving him some pastoral counsel from one older pastor to a younger pastor. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, now the end of the commandment, the end of the law, is charity. Verse 5. Did I not say that? Oh, 15. I'm sorry. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity, love, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Paul tells this young preacher, he says... He says, at the end of the law, you want to, at the end of obeying God, you want to make sure three things are happening. Number one, you are loving and you're not being a fake. You guys ever met a fake love, uh, somebody that loved you, but it was fake and it was just, ugh, you leave kind of feeling oily? Uh, Paul says, have genuine love. Genuine love. I believe the Bible is very clear that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I believe that the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that when, when you hear an evangelist speaking about the truths of heaven and hell, you should know at the time that that preacher is preaching in love, even if he's preaching some hard truths. But he says the end of the commandment is, is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience. That when you minister, you need to minister in a way in, in which uh, you're, you're not... Um, you're not bending the rules that, that your mind is, is clear. Can I, can I give you a little hint on the conscience? The conscience never works in gray areas. The conscience will either say right or wrong. Now, you might try to talk to somebody and go, oh, well, you know, it's not that bad. But I promise you, your conscience will say right or wrong. 
That's the reason why many people who sadly have, have committed suicide, they can't get away of their conscience condemning them. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. I got that number right, I'm pretty sure, Dave. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Now, hold on a second. You know what the Bible is saying here? That God will speak to you about what is right. God will speak to you about how to have a right relationship with Him. And the Bible says some, though their conscience have been sparked, they've put it away, they put it aside, and it says that their life has become shipwrecked. By the way, that's not a good thing. In other words, to disobey your conscience, especially as God is trying to call, as God is trying to woo you to Him, to disobey your conscience can easily destroy your life. As back to even going further, there seems to be a connection between denying your conscience and going into apostasy. It's a very serious thing. Your conscience is a very serious thing. I, I, I've always told uh, my, my kids, don't go against your conscience. I was... I got a ticket one time for driving without due care and attention. And I just thought, man, that's so arbitrary. <laughs> and when the officer explained what I had done, honestly, I was like, I didn't do that. So, uh, in America, and I have to keep on reminding myself, I'm not in America. <laughs> In America, you have something called traffic court. Right? They just deal with traffic stuff and just deal there. No lawyers are needed. You just kind of plead your case, blah, 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 blah. So I was ready for traffic court in England. Traffic court never came. As a matter of fact, I got from, uh, uh, from Her Majesty's High Court. Uh, you, you need to come in. And so I went in, again, still thinking it was like traffic court. So it was just me kind of walking in. And, uh, and the, the gentleman said, where's your solicitor? I don't have one. Do I need one? He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And so, so he explains everything. And he explains that not only, uh, he, he, he was the prosecuting attorney, by the way. He said, not only will I get the, the full fine, but also I had to pay court costs and everything like that. And he says, he says look, if you just want to plead guilty, uh, we'll save you some money. So I'm just, honestly, I'm there. And if you guys know me, I'm cheap. And anybody know that I'm cheap? I'm cheap. I don't like spending money. I'm cheap. Susie might not think that. Susie's our treasurer. She, she <laughs> but honestly, I'm cheap. But in the back of my head, I'm like, but I have to say I'm guilty for something that I don't feel I'm guilty of. <sighs> so... I told the guy, I said, no, I think I'm still going to still gonna go to court over this. He's like, okay. And, uh, and when he went away, I called my wife and I said, I said, by the way, today might be an expensive day. <laughs> and I explained to her and she says, well, at least you're not going against your conscience. By the way, I was found innocent. So that's, that's a good thing. But, but going back to verse 19 of 1 Timothy 1, when you... When you go against your conscience, that is just the way to destruction. I want you to think, how many times in your life have you done something and you went away so upset with yourself because you knew that was the wrong thing? Right? You knew it was the wrong thing. Your conscience was screaming. That, that check engine light was on. Your... Uh, uh, pull up, pull up, pull up, like in the cockpit of a plane. And you ignored it, and you ignored it, and bang! You did the wrong thing, and you went away. Why didn't I listen to my conscience? And we destroy ourselves. I would say most of the time that we have been hurt uh, emotionally and spiritually is because we have ignored our conscience. We have ignored. Um, and by the way, the conscience and the Holy Spirit are not the same thing.
but we've ignored the conscience. We've, we've ignored the wooing of the Spirit that have matched our conscience with the Word of God, and we've said, I don't care, I'm going to do it my way. I want you to know, scripturally speaking, that is a great way to shipwreck your life. 1 Timothy chapter 3, just a couple of verses over. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9. Paul says, holding the ministry of faith in a pure conscience. Christian, you cannot have a good walk with God and have a poor conscience. Do you know why? This is the problem with disobeying your conscience. Are you ready? So just listen to this. Let's go back with the original thing in Romans 14, where one person says, it's okay to meet offered unto idols, and the other one says, it is not okay. Okay? So the person who has the conscience that says, it is not okay to eat meat offered unto idols. First of all, is that person correct? Can he eat meat offered unto idols? Can he? Yeah, sure. Is there anything sinful about it? But what is his conscience telling him? It is sinful. It is wrong. Don't do it. Now get this. Even if he ignores his conscience to do a, an okay thing, he is still willingly saying, okay, I'm willing to sin because his conscience is telling it sin. He says, okay, I'll do it. Um, he's just trying to fit in with other people going against his conscience. See, that's the reason why the Bible says whatever is not of faith is what? Is sin. Because when we go in thinking that it's wrong, even if we're incorrect about it, we've actually gone against our conscience that have weighed the flag. This is a step you don't want to go on. This is something you don't want to do. Second Timothy, a couple, maybe a page over. Second Timothy, chapter one, verse three. Second Timothy, chapter one, verse three. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have re remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Do you see what his conscience told him? Pray for Timothy night and day. Let me ask you a question. Is it biblical that you have to pray for somebody night and day? Yes or no? No. But his conscience said, do it. And if he disobeyed his conscience, he actually would have had a there would have been something between him and the Lord. And by the way, it is possible that maybe the Lord put it on his heart to do it. You know what that reminds me of? Dads? Any of you decided, okay, every day we're going to have family altar. Every day we're going to open our Bibles. Every day we're going to pray. And that's good, amen? The Bible doesn't necessarily command that. The Bible does say in your interactions, you know, talk about the Lord as you're rising, going down, everything. But it doesn't necessarily say, dads, make sure you carve out, you know, six hours in the morning, you know, so you can do this. But if your conscience says it's right and you don't do it, how do you feel when you've blown it, Natalio? Huh? I'm a worthless dad. I failed my kids. They're all going to go and be gangsters, right? Pretty much. <laughs> Uh, continuing going to the right, um, the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Hebrews. Chapter 13, verse 18. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. 
See, part of the way, Christian, that you're going to live honestly before God and honestly before man is that you listen to your conscience. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. First Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation before God. Martin Luther, he was told, if you do not recant, if you keep with uh, your, your view of Scripture, um, you're evil, you're wicked, and uh, you're a heretic. He had to stay captive to his conscience because his conscience was captive to the Word of God. Even though everybody was, around him was calling him an evildoer, his conscience told him he was right. Have you ever been the only one that was saying the right thing when everybody else is screaming the wrong thing? Have you ever had to stand and say, hold on a second, this is bad, and everybody else say, no, no, it's good? We live in a time, and I, I want you to understand this. Christian, we live in a time where we are told that the most evil things that go on in this world are actually good. And many of the good things that go on are actually evil. And Christian, if you're going to be loving, you've now got to call evil good and good evil. Whenever society makes a flip-flop on a biblical standard that just everybody understood, And I see Christians, especially on social media, start posting on how that they're now aligned with worldly thinking. I, I, I will ask this one question. What scripture changed your mind? What scripture brought you from this point to this point? See, we, we live in a time that, that we've tried to remove all absolutes out of life. The human mind is like a boat. And, and what the world is trying to do is they're trying to tell you, cut every rope that is mooring you down. Cut the anchor clean off of you. And then they're surprised, now that you have no moorings, we're surprised that you become shipwrecked. Do you get it? And when the world is screaming for you to call light dark and dark light, your conscience is saying, hold on a second, stop, stop. It's, it's the warning light. Christians should live in such a way that they are approved by their moral conscience even if condemned by others. And I'm not saying where somebody just is in a hump and say, well, I'm right no matter what. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, that your conscience says, no, I'm good. Remember what he told Timothy? Love out of a pure heart. I was at Costco the other day, and I about wanted to kill somebody. Anybody ever want to just be James Bond just for a second? License to kill. Because here I am. I'm, anybody ever been to Costco? Okay. For those that have not had the pleasure of going to England's number one theme park, Costco, 
is uh, on your way out with your big trolley, um, you have to show your receipt on the way out. And they look at it. They look at what you have. And if you ask them, they'll say, well, we want to make sure we're charging you enough. Excuse me. We're not overcharging. I'm like, no, you're not. You're making sure I don't have a big screen TV hidden underneath my cornflakes. That's it. So anyways, here I am. I'm being a good citizen, good member of Costco. I'm, I'm waiting here. And this one, I'm, I'm now second, right? Second to the front. And the queue was by the hot dogs. It's, it's a while. And this guy just comes with his cart, and he's just walking by. And the lady says, excuse me, excuse me, the queue's there. He's just walking by. I had a guy behind me, and he was a proper lump of a man, and he was like, yeah, why don't you know? There was nothing in my heart that wanted to give him the gospel at that moment. I wanted to beat him with his lobster tails that he had in his cart. I did not love that man with a pure conscience. Amen. Now, what he did was wrong, and it wasn't socially okay. But that's not my job. And just the way I was thinking, my conscience was like, man, that wasn't right. And for the next two days, honestly, I've just been talking with the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. Really <laughs> We need a conscience that is clean, even if everything around us is going wrong. First Peter chapter three, verse 21. First Peter chapter three, verse 21. Like, excuse me, the like figure wherein to even baptism also now saves us not by the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We actually have... Um, did I see Jude in here earlier? Oh, yeah. Jude. Jude talked to me, I think it was last week, and about being, being water baptized. And so we talked about it. We, we talked about what it is. And, and uh, water baptism does not save you from your sin. Do you understand that? Water baptism doesn't save you from your sin. How can water, water does a hard enough time washing away dirt, let alone sin. And I'll be honest with you, Jude, if it washed away sin, I wouldn't want to be in the water with you, so your sin might get on me. And the scripture here says, in verse 21, it says, um, that it saves us, but not by the putting away the filth of the flesh. It, it, it doesn't remove sins. When you get water baptism, it's only after you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's one of the reasons why we do not baptize children in our church. We just don't see in Scripture where that happens. And we always see in Scripture that when somebody is water baptized, they've been able to make a confession with their mouth that they've received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. As a matter of fact, when, when, Jude, uh, when Jude said he wanted to get water baptized, I was like, why would you want to do that? I said, Jude, I'm going to try to talk you out of it the best I can. Didn't I say that? Yeah. Because we're, we're, we're going to follow him, and I just want you to know that's just out of obedience. And that's the reason why water baptism for the Christian, the one that's already received the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the reason why it says that it saves you from having a bad conscience. Because the scripture says the very next step of obedience after receiving him as Savior is to be water baptized. Why water baptized? It's a beautiful example of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. And that's just what he says. And I'll be honest with you, it's a, it's a great event. It's a great event in our church. I think, uh, Brad, you've been talking with me and, and Natalio about that. I mean, this is, 
These are, these are good things. But the Scripture says that, that if, if we, if we uh, hesitate from obeying the Lord, we're not going to have a clean conscience. Can I ask you a question? Have any of you walked away from a situation and you knew you should have uh, talked to somebody about the Lord? And I mean, and, and for the next whatever, you're just, it's just going over your head. That's the Holy Spirit saying go, and because you didn't, it affected your conscience. Does that make sense? Never go against your conscience. Your conscience can be cleansed. Your conscience can be purged. Your conscience can even be perfected. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9, again going to the left, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9, it says, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to conscience. In other words, what does that mean? The book of Hebrews in 9 verse 9 says, in the Old Testament, people sacrificed uh, lambs, sheep, uh, oxen. They did all these sacrifices, but none of those things could clean the conscience. Why? Because none of those things could remove sin. Every time that still happened, the conscience still said, I still am responsible to God. <laughs> Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? It's done, isn't it? My conscience is clean. My conscience is clear. A couple of verses over in Hebrews 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The redemption that we have in Christ actually purges our conscience to let us know we no longer need works we, because we have him. This is the reason why Christianity is not a religion of I got to do, I got to do, I got to do. Christianity is a religion of it's done. It's complete. Jesus Christ did it all. That's what we celebrated last week on the resurrection. Why would God come from earth, be born as a baby? We know we celebrate that at Christmas, don't we? Why would he do that, live a sinless, perfected life, and then be crucified? What is the reason? What is the purpose for that? The reason is, is that he died for our sins. He died that, that our guilt, our shame, our sin, our punishment could be removed. And this is what enables us to serve the living God. Now our conscience can be weak. I'll just read this. 1 Corinthians 8.12 says, But when ye sin against the brethren and wound their weak uh, conscience, you sin against Christ. Beloved, we can injure conscience. We can hurt other people's conscience. You might feel you have perfect liberty to do something, but I assure you, if your liberty hurts another believer's conscience, it is not right, it is not godly. Stop. When you help a Christian go against their conscience, even if they're misinformed, again, you're helping them to do wrong because you're telling them to go against their conscience. They even feel what they're doing is sin. They just feel comfortable because somebody else is allowing it. Sometimes Christian kids will start discussing about, is cussing really sinful? And they'll have this little debate, and they'll go, well, hell is a place, so you can say hell. And, uh, and some are damned, so you could say damn. And, and then they start going into the etymology of even some of the fun words, and they go, yeah, you know, we, 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 even Paul said, I count all things but dung, and so you could use all sorts of words for dung, and, and they're, they're trying to uh, uh, 
beat themselves up to go against their conscience. It's not safe. It's not safe. It wounds the conscience. It hurts it. The conscience can be defiled. 1 Corinthians 8, 7, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. In other words, they, they look at you eating something offered to an idol, and they're like, God, that's... That's so bad because it belongs to a different idol. So, anybody in here know what a monster is? Monster drink? So, I, I watched this video of a Christian explaining how satanic monster is. And because the letter M on there is actually not the letter M. Because a monster is a beast, ladies and gentlemen. And the little thing right there at the top is actually Hebrew 6, 6, 6. It's the mark of the beast. You're drinking the mark of the beast. No joke. Google it. Now, is there anything wrong with drinking a monster? <laughs> Naomi says, actually, your health, there's something terribly wrong with that. Okay? But... When somebody hears this, honestly, somebody who's, by the way, can I say what weak conscience means? It means that they can easily be hurt, easily be damaged. That's not necessarily even a bad thing per se. Because you got some lunkheads that have a strong conscience and nothing's going to get in that thing. And so when the Bible describes a weak conscience, it's like somebody being weak physically. They're weak morally in that they can be damaged morally easily. That's the point. Titus chapter 1, verse 15, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Because of, and this is talking about the lost, by the way, not the saved, the lost. Because the lost have a mind that is sinful, their conscience is not going to be okay. Again, you... It, you want to know what, what the greatest sin you can do? The greatest sin you can do is tell a seven-year-old, no, you can't have um, you know, reassignment sex surgery. Because if you really love them, you let that seven-year-old make that decision. Am I making it up? And their conscience screams, that is what's good. That is what's right morally. And we as a Christian, we, we have just a completely different mentality, don't we? When you hear uh, abortion being argued, we go, but life is precious. And the other one who's lost has their conscience. Later on, we, it's talked about being seared. They say, no. That might stop her from getting a job that she wants. I'm going to make a very misogynistic statement. Is everybody ready? You may burn me at effigy later. We have done a serious crime to both male and female. when we have told our daughters that they can have it all and that they need to do everything that a man does and they need to be the top of businesses and they need to do this and this and they can also be a mother. I will tell you right now, it is nigh impossible. And even those who have been single moms that have struggled with both, you understand it is so impossible. 
Do you want to know why income is so low? They've actually, because now there's so many people in the workforce, they only have to pay half. Do you know what happened when they stopped children from working? People's pay went up. Now, am I saying women shouldn't work? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, that when, for whatever reason, having a job is better than raising a godly family, And if you read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, uh, the woman, in, the godly woman, <laughs> is not just sitting at home knitting. Okay? I and mean, she's doing things. I mean, she's industrious. She's, she's like large and in charge. But her conscience had been told that if all you do is have a family, you have cheated yourself. I've talked to so many people that wish they would have started a family so much earlier and wish that they would have dedicated their lives more to the family. If you're angry at me, Pete made me say it. Talk to him about it. The conscience can be Evil. The conscience can be guilty. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. I'm almost done. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Listen, when you become born again, your mind goes from dark to light. 1 Timothy 4, 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Seared. I have a hot iron and I sear your hand. Is it going to hurt? Sure is. Next month, it will never hurt again. It'll have no feeling. And people who, who have heard the truth and their mind is, is being pricked by the truth, the, it hurts so much to reject the truth, but eventually they get to a point where they no longer can feel the truth. Have you ever seen people who can just so easily reject everything and it's just water off a duck's back? Any bit of spiritual truth goes out, I, I honestly, this verse comes. I, is are, are they seared? Well, those are some things about the conscience. It's, it's. I, I told you in order to go through Romans fourteen, it's going to take us a while. But do you see why it's so important to listen to your conscience? Do you see why it's so important to make sure your conscience is aligned with the Word of God? Again, this is, this, is, you, this is your soul's um, cockpit warning symbol. This is when, when, when the heart is thinking about doing sin, your conscience is saying, pull up, pull up. Your check engine light is saying, pull over, stop. And if we just ignore it, it's just going to be destruction, folks. In a moment, we're going to take part in the Lord's Supper. And we're going to sing, and then we're going to contemplate. But I want you to have your, your hearts and mind open to the Word of God and His Spirit and ask Him, have you been ignoring your God-given conscience? Have you misaligned 
pulled your conscience from Scripture? And if so, use that time to get things right with you and your Lord. Okay? Let's pray.